I'm sorry that the defense never rests, but I happen in this case, I happen to represent an innocent man. Not, not a technically not guilty man, but an innocent man. Tony Serra, the once and present and future flower child in the process of defending a man charged with drunk driving and possession of cocaine with intent to sell. If there was any evidence whatsoever that my client was a drug dealer, associated with drug dealers, had ever sold drugs, had ever possessed cocaine for sale, you sure would have had it. And it has not been suppressed. Nothing has been suppressed. In court, he is relentless in defense. There is nothing laid back about him. Other lawyers who don't feel the gusto, they don't have the grace of the calling, the feeling, therefore they can't emote. They don't feel strongly about anything. They're eclectic. They're, they're parasitical. The, the, those lawyers think you're acting because they have not felt anything for 20 years. They don't feel romance with their woman. They don't feel love for their kids. They're dead because society, you know, has dug into them and pulled it all out of them if it was ever there. They, they went to law school because they wanted to make a lot of money. They wanted a soft job. They wanted, uh, you know, allies with the wealthy and the powerful. So, of course, they think, you know, you're acting because you feel something. Unlike many of the flower children of two decades ago, who went on to firmly embrace middle-class values, Tony Serra's kept his values intact. The look is pure 60s. The hippie as middle-aged attorney. Dressed in cast-off clothing, an office that is a glorious litter bin. A room full of artifacts, a head and heart rooted in a decade. Are you nostalgic about it now? Sure. Sure? Shit, look at my hair. I mean, you know. I, I thought, you know... It was so unexpected and so overwhelming, and it was so profound. I wasn't prepared for it. And then it went so fast that I look back, you know, teary-eyed. Uh, it was a good, strong thing. It was like a, uh, a purification ritual for all of us. And indeed, I'm nostalgic about it. I would think that that Tony Serra coming in, looking the way Tony Serra looks, where it might be a look and a manner, at least initially, that the jury might find somehow threatening. No, you know, that's naive. That's that, naive. Let me finish. But apparently, once you get the mouth working on them, you get them in the palm of look, your hand. Looks don't make it. It ain't what the hell you look like. They don't care. They don't see you after a while. On occasion, uh, he looked really uh, uh, almost absurd. A, a suit that didn't fit, all the buttons were buttoned, uh, the, the sleeves were halfway up to his elbow, uh, the seam was split in his pants. Thomas Hastings, Superior Court Judge in San Jose. Tony relies upon his ability to use the uh, language, his uh, ability to advocate his persuasive qualities. And uh, he doesn't try cases by filing motions. He doesn't f uh, try cases by filing a lot of paper. He tries cases using his own abilities as an advocate to persuade jurors, and he does a great job. We strive for truth, but there will be no absolute truth. But there is reasonable doubt standard. So don't search here for absolutes. You just measure this case by whether or not there is reasonable doubt. If, for instance, at the end of the case you say, I think he probably did it. Probably. Probably is guilty. What then would be your duty under the law? Your duty then under the law is to return a verdict of not guilty. Because the criterion is not probability. The criterion is beyond a reasonable doubt into a moral certainty. If you think he possibly did it, he could have done it, he probably did it, he's not guilty. Do you understand that it's the highest standard ever conceived on the face of the earth? It's the thing when we speak most boastful about our system that we commend to historians. It's a good and strong rule. 
and it separates us from overreaching government. It separates us from, you know, uh, forces that would control our destiny. It gives us ultimately the choice. In more than half the cases he takes, Sarah chooses to work for nothing. The legal community in San Francisco, which holds his courtroom talent in high regard, says if he wanted to, he could be a millionaire. In fact, he earns about 20000 a year, but owns almost nothing. No credit cards, buys nothing new. He drives a car that is almost comatose, but his own private spirit of 66 remains undented. He's a tax protester and 10 years ago went to jail for four months for refusing to file a return. His main work, he says, is with the underclass, charged with murder or drug offenses. You defend drug dealers and they're hardly a, a deprived class in our society. Drug dealers may well have material prosperity at one level of their life, but at another level of their life, they are victimized. They're victimized by entire, you know, state of government that seeks them out as targets. I, I feel self-righteous. I feel indignant about that. I can, you know, wax uh, philosophic. I can, the battle cry just comes naturally out of my throat on those kind of cases. So I don't feel anything for the, for the authoritative figure who betrays, you know, the values that he pretends to promote. I feel nothing well, for him. So you defend, you've defended Huey Newton? Yeah, uh, sure Panthers, yeah. Russell Little of the uh, Simeon, SLA, of yes, the sure. SLA, the Hell's Angels. The Hell's Angels. Last you vestige, you know, of uh, whatever, a free, uh, untainted, uh, uh, poetic uh, symbol in our culture. Beautiful people, you know, free on a motorcycle. Going. Should, look, you saying that, I'm sure probably two million people have just turned their television sets off because because to, to hear no, no, someone... They, no, they know it. The common man, you know, loves the Hells, the Hells Angels. Angels. What, poetry on wheels. Listen, they love Why? the cowboys, and they love the Hells Angels. What about when they... So they get, well, every once in a while they get in a fight, or every once in a while maybe, you know, a shooting somebody. will occur. But statistically, they're far in the minority. Every once in a while, they'll pull someone into their clubhouse and rape her. That's not Hell's Angels qua Hell's Angels. That's a human being in the excess of his behavior. We're talking about Hell's Angels. Hell's Angels is a motorcycle club that stands for you know a spirited, aggressive form of rugged individualism. That's the, the kind of tenet that our country has always accepted and really romanticized. Something wrong with Hell's Angels. For all his radical philosophy, Sarah comes to the law with the very best traditional credentials. He's 48 now and bears little resemblance to the excellent student and top athlete at Stanford, where he played for both the football and the baseball teams. A philosophy major at Stanford, he went on to Berkeley Law School, where he was law review, then took a job as a district attorney. I had something like 35 jury trials in 11 months at the DA's office. I was like 10 years ahead of any of my peers. And I worked hard, and unfortunately people went to jail, and I convicted people, and I find that that's a flaw in me. And if I had to do it over again with the view that I have now, I wouldn't do it. I did wrong. But I did it in, in, uh, in, a, in a pragmatic way. I wanted to learn to be a trial lawyer. Sarah spends long days during the week on legal work in San Francisco. On weekends, he heads for Bolinas, one of the last enclaves of the hippie generation, where he devotes his time to his family, artist Mary Edna Deneen and their five children, all of whom he delivered himself. He practices in his private life anyway the preachings of the 60s. The lives the children lead would, to some, seem unconventional. I doubt that. Unconventional. Not at all.